Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. My name is Carrie Hartsoe and I'm the director of classic music here at Cornerstone. And if you're joining us in person, which we have a lot of fine folks here today, or if you're joining us virtually, we're glad you're here. Let's begin our time together this morning. If you would please stand for our opening hymn. Cornerstone. Welcome to Cornerstone United Methodist Church. Our guests, welcome. We're grateful to have you with us both here in the sanctuary and online. It's great to be able to worship with you uh, on this special day where God reaches out to us and calls us to be a people. We might discover who you want us to be and how you want us to live. God, you have to understand, we already think we have it all figured out. We figured it out a long time ago. Today, surprise us by offering your spirit and your grace to restore us again and to rework some of the thoughts and ideas and relationships that we think we've already figured out. Help us today to realize you are much greater than us, just beginning to lead us is the direction you want us to go. Make us willing to follow you. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. We find the Apostles' Creed a statement of faith that binds us together. Let's join together in our statement of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I believe we have, Mike, some announcements to, to play today. Have we, have we, we didn't play them yet. Did we? Welcome to Cornerstone. Thank you for joining us today. If you are here in person, please silence your cell phone and have a seat. For those online, sit back, relax, and join us for a meaningful day of worship. Before we begin, here are a few announcements and prayer requests. Please keep the following in your prayers. Roe, who is in hospice care. David, who is recovering from pneumonia. Patricia will be having knee replacement surgery on Monday. 
Janet and Colin's son Chris has COVID, scarring on the lungs, and pneumonia. Family and friends of Nick Brown, who passed away recently. Patsy needs continued prayers for her niece, Kate, who has cancer. Karen's sister-in-law, Ann, is battling cancer and treatments are not working as hoped. And please keep everyone else in your prayers who needs prayer that was not mentioned here this morning. We are no longer requiring reservations for our in-person services. However, our greeters will use an iPad to begin a new check-in process that will help us to keep our records up to date and stay in touch with you. As you enter the building, please give your name to the greeter or check back with them sometime before the start of service so that we know that you have attended service. Thank you for your help. Tailgate worship has been postponed for the rest of the summer due to the summer heat and our ability to move worship inside. Thank you for those who participated in these unique services. Audrey, that was a fantastic game you had today. Yeah, it was, even though we lost the game. Well, sometimes in soccer, that's what happens. But I'm all sweaty. Let's stop and get something to drink. Well, that's great. But how about if we stop by the bank first? I need to get some checks. Why do you need checks? When I go to church, I fill out a check on the money I'm going to be giving them. Come on, Karen, not so old fashioned. Why don't you use auto pay through your bank? It'll send you money automatically. And you can stop it or change it anytime. I don't know how to do that. That's so easy. My mom knows how to do it. She'll teach you. Yes, let's ask your mom to help me set up the automatic bill pay. You know what? That deserves an ice cream. Ice cream, ice cream. Let's get some ice cream. Jesus teaches it is better to give than to receive. If you would like to give a morning offering today, we have a few options. You may download the Give Plus app through the App Store or Google Play Store by searching for Cornerstone United Methodist Church, O'Fallon, Missouri. You can also give through our website by clicking the Give Online tab, our Vanco Electronic Giving, Online Banking, In-Person Offering Box, or by sending your check to Cornerstone through the U.S. Postal Service. Thank you for your generosity. I don't know about you, but now I want ice cream. <laughs> that was adorable. You know, during the summer, I always think back to my childhood. In um, at my grandparents' church. So this middle hymn here this summer, um, I'd like to dedicate it to some of our favorites, our favorite hymns that we love. Last week we did uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus This Week. Um, we're going to do Amazing Grace, but if you have a favorite, feel free to reach out to me. Send me an email or get a hold of Stacy or someone in the office and let me know if you have a favorite that we haven't done lately so we can include it in our lineup. So if you would please stand with me for Amazing Grace.
this morning. Good boys. Thank you. You may be seated. Last year, as we were challenged to figure out how do we minister in a time when we can't actually worship in person together, Cornerstone had to figure out how to be the church. Three of our staff people uh, met with the video team uh, earlier this year to record videos looking back on last year, seeing how God's promised to be with us. And so I hope you'll watch this video and see how God's promises were kept last year during one of the most challenging times we faced in ministry. Gosh, I guess it was November of 2019, and they started talking about this um, disease that was causing pneumonia and other problems in uh, China. So we actually knew in March of 2020, um, I think it was the second week where we were practicing um, at practice on Tuesday nights, and we were kind of distant from one another. We felt like something was kind of weird going on, and it was that weekend that Mike came sold services and then the the county started shutting down the states and different people started shutting down services and different all different kinds of places we had no idea it was going to last that long we thought maybe it'd be a couple weeks started to have our meetings and talk to uh, one another um, zoom meetings and such to figure out what the next step was for cornerstone and that's where um, the, the the great staff of, of cornerstone really stepped up and even the volunteers i can't say enough for the volunteers you know like like you guys um uh, it really takes it, it takes the whole village i think it was april where we started doing things virtually brandon and i had to play our instruments and sing in our houses and we had to use our phones for recording that <laughs> but again god nudging us saying hey man here's an opportunity whether there's a pandem pandemic or not um you you can go online and reach hundreds of more people, maybe thousands, you never, you never know. I started taking content from the praise team who began practicing distanced and far apart and the classic worship videos that the video team was doing and some other content from Dr. Mike and Kids Jam. I started taking those and I started compiling what became the virtual Sunday services. Perina was working on, you know, building the thing to, and putting all of the videos together. We were trying to develop different ways that we could use the warmer weather to reach people in person but safely. And so Brandon had already talked about how he had all of this equipment at home that was a godsend because nobody else had any of that equipment. So, I mean, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of equipment. I had some friends that had some equipment. You know, and, and with me playing out, I had the knowledge of how to set it all up and make it work. Uh, the praise team and with Mike Cochran, and he could help uh, get that going. And Mike luckily had stuff in the media booth that we could use. And I think we ordered a FM transmitter that was brand new. But it was, a, it, it was a, a lot of different elements that really came into place. So we all kind of came together for that vision, and we ended up developing the parking lot worship all together. God was good for the weather. I think we only maybe had, I don't even know if we had one. Did we have one? Yeah, I think we just had one bad, uh, bad day. So it was good. I really enjoyed doing that. Greg and the video team took over. I had some equipment and one of those things was a gimbal and so I've been able to film the modern worship team as they've been doing their services. We all kind of work together where Greg has started doing our uh, praise team videos on Tuesday nights basically putting all of the different pieces of the media together and downloading the media to make these worship services, the whole Sunday service that everybody sees on Sunday morning. I think that they said we have 600 views on our recent services. I felt kind of, you know, a little bit overwhelmed in the beginning of everything, but then I realized over time that luckily some of my past experiences were through God working through me. In the same way with, with God whispering in, in your conscience and stuff too, you know, sometimes you choose to push away, you know, resist a little bit and other times you don't. And I hope, I hope we choose not to resist, um, you know, what, what God is calling us to do and the direction that we really need to move. It's interesting, this whole process from the beginning of the pandemic through now, we've all learned how to do 
technology that we had thought about in the past, but this pushed us into it and it's really taken us leaps and bounds ahead of where we thought we would be at this point in time. And we're actually here today working on putting in uh, materials and equipment for the streaming system. We're gonna be having a live stream of our uh, church services and uh, all of our activities going forward. And that requires a completely different kinds of cameras and different kinds of equipment. It's been a crazy year, but it's been really fun. Although it's been sad, it's been really fun to kind of develop new ministries in different ways and make a church that's fruitful. I always say coincidence. Is it, you know, was God preparing me for this stuff? Put your mind to it and your passion and you got, you know, the drive of Jesus behind you. It's, it really pushes you to do it. I feel like the pandemic has really required a lot of patience and flexibility. So definitely feel like God has been working through me. It's worked out really good and I feel like God prepared me for this. I appreciate the video team and our staff involved in that we just don't expect to have to, to face to be ready for. I think about last year and the challenges we faced in ministry. And now looking back on last year, I have to tell you, there is one nostalgic part of our ministry last year that I kinda kinda missed. The the parking lot worship, when I did something all right, you honked. And I don't, no honks anymore. I really kind of am disappointed. So if you would, if you please get your phones. I know not now. After service, load on your phones an app that's for car horn honking. I can't wait until next week, all the car horn honking. In fact, I expect some of the people online to send me emails with just the simple sound of the car horn honking. That'd be great. God promises to prepare us before we know it through grace to be the people we're meant to be, to minister in ways that changes the world and changes us. God's working in you and me and promising to walk with us, to to keep an eye on us, to lead us forward in faith. Our scripture for this morning, Ephesians 2, 11 and following, talks about how God fulfills promises through Jesus Christ, and we need to claim those promises. Here are these words of life meant for us today. But don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you, outsiders to God's ways, had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. Now, because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it altogether are in on everything. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this is part of a message series titled Promises and looking back and moving forward, believing that God's promises were with us last year during one of the most to a future together that helps us to grow in faith. Today I want to talk about reworked and restored relationships. God promises to rework and restore relationships that lead to eternal life. Have you ever noticed that there are really it, just a few kinds of relationships based on either or situations? Have you noticed this? How many relationships do you have in your life that are either or relationships? You know what I mean? They're either with you or they're against you. They're either right or they're wrong. They're either Cardinals fans or the Royals fans in Missouri. What about they're reworked or they're not yet restored? I want to suggest to you that our relationships are constantly being reworked by God in order for us and those relationships to be restored. That this restoration is an ongoing work that God never stops doing in us. Sometimes we think we've already got it all figured out, 
And that's when we really need to start looking back to God and saying, God, what else are you doing in me? God is reworking everything. The scripture for this morning speaks to how God is leading us to understand everything is being reworked through Christ. This is the first idea this morning. God is reworking everything. What does it mean for God to be reworking everything? It means that sometimes we do not understand just how much God is doing. It means that there are always going to be times as God reworks everything that will be uncomfortable. If you're like me, it's nice to be comfortable. It really is. So this first idea again, God is reworking everything. The idea behind this first idea is really simple. That we can't get too comfortable with God. Because God is always actively working to renew us and restore us and work through. any of this for granted was that don't take any of what for granted the the saving grace of God the the work in the church is what the the author of this letter to the Ephesians is talking about speaking to people who are receiving this letter learning and thinking about what God is doing in their lives so the Bible says to you and me today don't take any of what God is doing in your life and in the church you're a part of, for granted. It's easy to do that, by the way. It's easy to get comfortable in a relationship with God. Again, the scripture says, it was only yesterday, this is kind of exaggeration, but still, only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You see, there was a time just before the scripture was written, when there were just only two kinds of people. Only two kinds of folks. This letter in Ephesians is being written to people who used to be the outsiders, completely clueless to what God was doing. Here the Bible reveals to us that we are discovering who God wants us to be because God reveals what God is doing through Jesus Christ. Again, it goes on to say, you knew nothing of the rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel. Why do we keep the Old Testament? Someone asked me that. I've had to ask over and over again over my ministry time. You know, why do we keep the, the Old Testament? It's a lot of complicated stuff. There's a lot of genealogies that don't seem to have any purpose. What about all those laws for food and sacrifices that we don't even worry about now? Here the book of Ephesians reveals to us that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, reveals the work of God before we knew God. Important for us to know who God is and what God is doing. But because of Jesus Christ, because of him sacrificing his life, dying death for us, we are now allowed to be part of the insider group. God is reworking everything, says the scripture. So I want you to suspend your know-it-all-ism. It's tough for me to do. But for a moment, allow the Bible to do the thinking for you. To shape your mental vision. To change the way you see yourself in the world and everyone and everything around you. Allow the Bible to inform you about how things really are from God's perspective. Can you do that? Can you trust the Bible for just a few minutes and completely suspend all other judgment and just say, God, teach me what I need to know. Here, we're learning from the Bible. God is reworking everything. That reworking leads to God 
and a promise. God promised a Savior for all people, and the Bible says God delivered. Now, here's where we really have trouble believing, right? Is God really promising a Savior for all? I know where you are. And I grew up a Royals fan. I cannot imagine, if I go back in time, I couldn't imagine as a kid rooting for the St. Louis Cardinals. In fact, I had relatives living in St. Louis. That didn't make me like the Cardinals. Isn't it amazing how things can change? I meet some girl up in Kirksville, Missouri while I'm in college. It seems innocent at the time. Little did I know I would be completely transformed and become a Cardinals fan. Of all the things to happen in my life, is it possible that God is doing the unimaginable in this world, in and through you? Is it possible that God has promised to save you for all people and God has delivered Again, the scripture says the Messiah, the promised Savior, has made things up between us so that we, that we, we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. Christ tore down the wall. We used to keep up each other of us at a distance. Remember, the first Christians were all Jews. There was no Christian. By the time Ephesians is written, this book in the New Testament we're studying today, it's clear that there's a new faith developing, the Christian faith. And the first Christians were all people who trusted in those Old Testament Hebrew Scripture promises and saw those promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But then God did something nobody expected God to do. God took away the separation between people who were insiders, were God's people, and outsiders, those who weren't part of God's people. Suddenly, the people who weren't part of God's plan were all part of God's plan. It was confusing, as confusing as what I just said. To the people who were living through those early days of the Christian faith, they could not understand how people who they'd always been told and believed and understood to be different and strange and excluded from God's work, we're now all part of the same family. The Bible says that as we place our faith in Jesus Christ, our eyes are open to a reality that already exists, and it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, it's already happening. And we're encouraged to get on board with what God is doing, which is to see that the walls that separate people from people are being destroyed as God invites everyone in to an eternal family. There are no insiders and outsiders anymore. There are only those who accept and follow the Savior and those God keeps calling to follow the Savior. Again, the scripture says, he repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. Then Jesus started over through God. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, God created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everyone. You know, when I read some of the, the Hebrew scriptures, some of the Old Testament, progressed, and the people of Israel continued to keep the laws found in their scriptures that they added to laws. They refined the laws. They made them more complicated. It became difficult to follow a law so clogged with fine print, as our translation says. But what the, the laws of the Old Testament that the people of Israel did for certain is make sure that some people could never be part of God's work. Isn't that interesting? What the people of Israel thought was happening was 
that they were supposed to get something from God. That was the whole plan for them. If we do these things, we get something from God. And we don't have to give something to anyone else. We don't have to let anybody else in on these promises. We just get these promises for ourselves. Think about how few people were actually in the, the nation of Israel for the centuries that existed prior to Jesus Christ. A very small percentage of the world's population. The Bible is very clear. God intends for all of humanity to discover the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God started over with Jesus Christ. What a challenge for us to see that animosity and suspicion of other people is, is not at the heart of the, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Instead, Jesus wishes to bring people together. Jesus Christ is a uniter who restores promised relationships to God and others. Restoring relationships. You know, it's an interesting idea to let God restore our relationships. As followers of Christ, I've discovered that we have a tough time relating to friends and family because we're human. I'm no different than you. It's a challenge to relate to other people. People have different ideas than we do. Don't you all understand I'm right? <laughs> Don't you want to say that to people all the time? Don't you want to say to people, listen, we are certain that we're more right than someone else. It leads to the separation of people from people. Families, usually, are the center point of the disintegration of relationships. Really, haven't you noticed that you treat your family worse than everybody else? Unless you're just a really, really bad person and you just treat everybody badly. I mean, it's nothing like having your out-in-the-real-world persona and then your real self at home. You know what I mean, don't you? We're all, to some degree, like that. You can't get any angrier than you can with your family, can you? Jesus Christ wishes to unite us, starting in our homes and moving out into the world, but uniting people all over the world, all over the nation, even in our state, even Royals fans and Cardinals fans. This isn't something to just kind of brush over in the Bible here. This is really where the Bible becomes difficult. How do I know this? From the first century on, Christians have been dividing up amongst ourselves who's right and who's wrong, who's more right, who's more wrong. Every generation of Christians is struggling with this part of Ephesians because we just have difficulty remaining united. Why? Because there's always something that ticks us off, that makes us mad, that frustrates us, that confuses us, that threatens us. Isn't that true? I mean, when you think about it, really, have you ever sat next to a diehard Royal fan at Bush Stadium? Oh my gosh, if the Royals were actually gonna play well, now move beyond sports. Some of you don't even like sports. You can't even relate to this. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and someone ordered something that was just the stinkiest thing you have ever smelled in your life and they love it? Oh my gosh, you decide for yourself right then, we're not coming to this restaurant ever again with them. Now imagine life. Those really difficult sticking points. Those difficult things you choose not to talk about. Because you know if you talk about it with this family member or this friend, you probably won't get back together for a long time, or maybe ever. How is it that followers of Christ who pledge their entire life to be willing to say yes to the one who dies and is resurrected, how is it those of us who say we have life in eternity through faith in Jesus Christ, how is it that we consistently, consistently, every generation destroys relationships with each other rather than builds them up because we are convinced 
that we're reading the law better than the other person. Jesus Christ is meant to be a uniter who restores promised relationships to God and others. 2,000 years ago, the Bible says that people who never got included in anything God was doing suddenly were included. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got to us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Here the Bible is speaking in ideal terms, helping us to understand that the reality is different than what we believe is happening. One of the things the Bible in Ephesians is revealing to us today is that God is doing stuff we can't understand and that we are living in an incomplete world with an incomplete vision of what God is doing. One of the things we're confused about is we actually think there's hostility between Christians. We think we're right and they're wrong, whoever they are. See, that's the mistake we're making. There is no hostility anymore. God is breaking down barriers eternally. We need to be willing to embrace that, to figure out how to get along, because we've got eternity to live with each other. You think, you think last year was a long time. You know, I have found, by the way, that this is one of the most controversial things I ever preach about, the idea that we're actually going to live in eternity with everyone else who God lets in. It's so funny. Someone told me a joke last week. I've heard the joke a hundred times. It turns out it's been told all around the world, and the punchline is just a little bit different depending on where you stand, who the insider is and who the outsider is. The joke that I grew up with was about a particular brand of Christian and how they're very exclusive, and when you get to heaven, you have to be quiet when you walk by their, their room because they don't realize anyone else is in heaven but them. I grew up Baptist, so you can imagine what other groups we picked to be the ones who did. We thought, of course, you know, the joke goes like this. A man dies one day. St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates. They're walking through heaven. The man, he, Peter, uh, uh, Apostle, uh, Peter says, uh, okay, in this room, oh, man, these are great fans here. Man, they're having the greatest time. Who are they? Well, you know, it's the Cubs fans. You know, every day is a party. It doesn't matter whether they win or lose. They're used to losing most of the time. You're going to have a lot of fun in there. They're, but, they're, but they're winners too because they, all the Cubs fans are in there. It's great. They'll let you in. They'll have a great time with you. Go to the next room, right? Yankees fans are there. It's a little difficult to get into the room with them because there's so many people in the room and, and they're a little obnoxious. But, you know, they'll let you in. Go to the next room. Shh, quiet, right? Well, why are quiet? Well, the royals are in this room. They don't think anybody else is here, right? That's the joke, the joke. Um, you know, the idea is that every group of people tends to think they're uniquely important to God. And that's the illusion that we live with. Not realizing what's actually happening is God is removing the hostility that should be dividing us. Again, the scripture goes on to say, Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders, and peace to us insiders. God treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him we share, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. Through Jesus Christ, we all have access to the same God who is, whose spirit lives in us, See, that's the most disappointing thing from the Bible's perspective about how Christians have been living out God's promises for the last 2,000 years is that we have failed to realize we all share the same Holy Spirit. We don't realize that the hostilities are actually over if we look into eternity. God... through God is inviting us inviting everyone to make Christ the cornerstone of life, which extends from an eternal promise. God wants us to build our lives, how we see ourselves, how we see the world, how we see what God is doing in the world, how we see how we relate to other people, to build everything on the cornerstone that is the, the source of an eternal foundation, that is Jesus Christ. The scripture says, that's plain, isn't it?
are no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. You belong here. You belong here with as much right to the same Christian and to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. The strange thing about what God is doing is God is building a home for us, and God is building a temple for all, irrespective of how we got here in what he's building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. You have a crucial role to play in God's eternal work. You are part of the building blocks that make up the temple in which God now resides. Not a temple made out of stone or concrete or steel. A temple made out of spirits giving themselves over. To the work of Jesus Christ. God's inviting you to join in the work Christ has made possible, promising an eternal life and a You know, last year we couldn't be in physical proximity to each other for worship. One of the most difficult times in the life of this church that's over 200 years old and in the ministry I've experienced in my life. And so we did something out of necessity that will continue to be crucial. We built a new church on the foundation of a 214-year-old church. We, we built a digital church, a ministry out in the world that allows people, wherever they might be, to worship and learn and, and share life together and grow in faith together. You know, every Sunday, in addition to those who are in the room in worship in our sanctuary, we have people in the room in our digital sanctuary worshiping too. More people, sometimes twice as many people at least, as we have here in this physical place. Amazing how we had to figure out how to, to be part of that invitation that Christ is offering to everyone. When I think about the temple God is building now, it's not one that we can see physically. It's one that's eternal built on lives. Isn't that a strange thing to think about? Ephesians is teaching us no longer can we find God in just one place. No longer can we find God in just one place. The work God started doing 2,000 years ago was virtual, depending on human lives for a new temple that was eternal that wasn't built by hands, but was built by faith. It wasn't built out of materials that led to something physical you stood in, but was built on lives that extended beyond borders and time. It's amazing to me to see how God is inviting everyone to be part of what Christ did on the cross. And that's the challenge for us today, to be part of that promise. The Bible is promising us that we are all offered and in need of Christ's saving grace. So today you have a mandate, an expectation from God to believe in the Bible's teachings 
to realize that the grace you needed to be saved is the grace everyone else around you needs too. What will we do next? What do we do next? First, tear down the walls that divide us. Claim Christ's promised peace. Nice to say. Listen, I, I'm not naive anymore. I'm almost to 27 years of ordained ministry. I used to think that my sermons were it. I'd with my family and argue about where we were eating. I wasn't even being changed. So listen, I'm not fooling myself here. But we need to understand what we're supposed to do next is begin tearing down the walls that divide us from other followers of Christ first. Because if a house is divided, how will it stand? And then we need to move out into the world and tear down those walls that are keeping us from sharing God's saving grace with others. This is claiming Christ's promised peace. See, this is the mistake we make. We think that the Bible is meant to keep us from being threatened by other people. Instead, it's meant to offer us peace that leads us out into the world where others may threaten us because their walls have not yet been torn down. What do we do next? Tear down the walls that divide us. Claim Christ's promised peace. And then invite people we know to be part of Christ's work, the, the Spirit's promised anointing and inspired work here at Cornerstone. It has never been easier to invite someone to be part of the ministry of the Cornerstone United Methodist Church. In 214 years, Christ through the ministry of Cornerstone. You may be watching me right now, worshiping with me right now, and you may be in another state. If you're lucky, you're sitting on a beach in the Bahamas. Don't send me pictures. I won't be happy. Think about this for a minute. It used to be scary to invite someone to come to church. Because what if they said no? Or what if the next day they made fun of you because you're a Christian? Even worse, what if they decide you're not that kind of people and so they stop talking to you? See, now you don't have to worry about any of that. You just say, hey, you should watch this online so this next week. It was pretty fun. Or it was inspirational. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it'll answer one of those questions you just asked me. Inviting people to be part of the digital church here at Cornerstone is one of many ways now to invite people to be part of the work God is doing in the, the people of Christian faith called Cornerstone United Methodist Church. See, this is actually the mandate. We are called to realize we don't have an exclusive faith. We're not insiders, separated by those who are outsiders. Now we're meant to go get everyone, to reveal to them the promises they don't yet know God's been working to, to reveal. Where are you called to go? How is God reworking and restoring you in a way that leads you to live better by faith and invite others to be part of Jesus' saving grace. It's, it's why we pray, by the way. As we pray, we discover what God is doing in us, and we find the courage and strength and vision to go out into the world and do what we're called to do. This is what it means for God to be building an eternal temple, person by person, built on that cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Today, promises can be held on to Promises that have been kept and will continue to be kept through our faithfulness. I think it's important for us then to be in prayer today and every day in our week. Seeking God's help first to accept the promises and claim them and then to go out and live those promises. Think about the people you know who need God's saving grace and care. There are people in desperate physical health situations. There are people emotionally, economically struggling. There are people with relationships that are just overwhelming them. And you can be that person that simply offers the peace of God through Christ. 
Prayer should be that lifeline that you hold on to and that you offer to others too. So let's take a moment. As I pray, you pray silently. Let's speak to God about what matters most to us and then look forward to the ways God is going to lead us out into the world to be the people of God offering God saving grace, tearing down those walls that are keeping us from others, embracing others as Christ embraces us. Let's pray together. God, help us to believe your word, to trust in your truth, to hold on to your promises and live those promises out. As you continue to work in us, God, restore us and rework us so that we might reach out to others and invite them to your son. God, we remember those who are in need of your care, those who are struggling for health, those who are needing your grace those who have relationships and even lives that seem hopeless. God, help us to be the hope, the reflection of your Son for others. Now, God, remind us of what it means to be your people. Teach us to pray as we remember your Son's prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And may this be the beginning of a week rediscover God walking. So it's been great to worship with you today. I look forward to hearing and discovering how God is working in and through you as you hold on to these promises being offered to you today. Let me offer a blessing to conclude our time together. As we leave this place, the grace of God and light of Christ go before us. Today, you're offered the promised blessing to be people of God, offered peace in your hearts, a peace that leads you to offer Christ to others. So go and be the hands and feet of Christ this week. Amen. Thank you.